So first of all, I want to do a little trick. Just pick up a card, anyone, and concentrate on it, because I'm going to ask you a question later about it. You have it, all of you? Yeah. OK. And this is not working. Then. Oh, because it's not in there. <laughs> Here. That's pretty good. Now you have plenty of time. OK. You have it? It's gone. I removed it. OK. What I did was just to uh, make you all think of the same card. And then, since I, I decided on the card, then I can just remove it, right? No, not exactly. But, uh, well, later we can discuss this. But this shows that we have a problem with vision, right? And the main problem with vision is that vision has nothing to do with images. Vision is about processing information, but no images at all, OK? It's about understanding the world. If I ask you what do you see here in this image, what could you tell me? Rabbit. A rabbit. Most of you would tell me, oh, this is a rabbit. All of you, of course, know this is a plastic bag. But it's a lot more interesting to say a rabbit. It carries a lot more information than just simply a, a plastic bag of the supermarket. How about this? OK, now we divide in, in, in different age ranges. So I heard Fisherman, which is probably something about my age. My son says this is uh, Anakin Skywalker, also to take, to take back there. <laughs> and so it's, it's but it's, there's a lot of more information than just simply wrapping paper, which is what it is, right? twisted in a very funny, particular way. OK, so in vision, we have a problem. Actually, we have three problems with vision. This is one of them. This is the first problem of vision, and it's that the brain never has access to reality, to the world. All the brain has access to is the image that, the rea that reality projects on the retina, right? And this is already a problem because the retina is a flat surface, so we only have 2D. And real objects in the world can actually project very funny images in 2D. Can you see the faces here in the spots? OK. And, and this is tremendously difficult problem to solve because how many solutions has a flat image in the real world? Do you know? How many different objects could have created this image? How many different? Infinite. Infinite objects. That's the problem, first problem that the brain has to solve. And it's interesting because many different objects can create a single, a single image, as I said. These are images, uh, shadow sculptures by Shigeo Fukuda. And they seem to emerge, these beautiful shadows seem to emerge from this seemingly random pile of junk. Right? OK. So it's extremely, extremely difficult. How do we solve it? We solve it doing statistics, basically. If we receive this image in our retinas, most likely the object that produced that image is a piano and not this particular deconstructed version of it. It's a real piano. And that's how we do it. From very early on, from the first day, uh, years of life, we start to build a catalog. We start to associate um, stimulation patterns in our retina to real objects in the world, 3D objects. And that catalog is the one we use later on to create the perception of reality. Okay? This is a process that uh, stays with us, with us through life. Okay, the second problem that we have for vision is that our brain is extremely expensive. I am, and I mean metabolically expensive, of course. We have 10 to the 12 neurons, basically, if we take into account also the spinal cord, not only the brain, but we have 10 to the 12 neurons that communicate with each other, as we've seen in earlier talks, through synapses, 10 to the 15. And the neural code that uh, Mike Heuser discussed before is based on action potentials. And action potentials, these really brief uh, uh, electric signals, are expensive in terms of, of ATP. ATP is the metabolic currency of our brain, of our, of our body. Okay? 
each action potential, uh, we need to produce each action potential on each cell, we need 2.4 times 10 to the 9 ATP molecules. That's an astronomic number, okay? And we get only 30 ATP molecules out of each glucose molecule that goes through the glycolytic pathway, which is the, the pathway that actually breaks down glucose to produce energy, the energy, okay? If we do the numbers, if we now put these two things together, we realize that we need eight times 10 to the 20 molecules of glucose to have all of our neurons producing just one single action potential, okay? Just one of them. This is a really large number, or it's not. I mean, to produce this, so we have this number of, of, of glucose molecules in 0.024 grams of sugar, which is really a very low number, particularly if you take into account that sugar is also made of fructose, which also enters the glycolytic pathway. So we need even less than that. We need 0.02 or something like that, sugar, to have all, our, all the neurons in our brain producing just one action potential. Now, this is funny because when they are extremely uh, involved in information processing, neurons produce even hundreds of action potentials per second, which means that given this talk, I should have a sugar cube per second just to be to standing up here and talking to you. Impossible, absolutely impossible. So, the funny thing is that if you extrapolate to a full day, this becomes 130 kilograms of sugar per day. And if you take into account that the cost of production, of producing action potentials, is only 13% of the total cost of maintaining the brain, then that becomes a ton a day of sugar. So that's how expensive the neural tissue is. Obviously, we don't use that much sugar. We, our brain is extremely well designed to work in a very economic fashion. Actually, it consumes only, ha only twice as many as an iPad. That's the real number here, okay? Good. So how do we do it? Basically, how do we solve this second problem? Basically, we isolate ourselves from a lot of the information that's available in reality. This is Manuel, a friend of mine, and actually one of my co-workers. And uh, can you tell the difference between the two pictures of Manuel? Really? Okay. Which one has higher visual acuity or which one has higher resolution? The one on the right, right? Okay. Now look at the central point right there. Can you tell the difference? Not anymore, right? Let me see. Okay, not anymore. And this is, and I want you to do something now. I want you to raise your, your arm, one of them, with the thumb up, okay? Can you see the nail? Look at the nail. The nail is basically a, a degree of visual angle in size. Okay, you have it. Anywhere else in the visual world, anywhere else, you are legally blind. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the only place in the whole visual image where you have reasonably good visual acuity. Everywhere else, you don't. Manuel's example, but also, if you want to do this, move your hand towards your thumb. You don't see it very well until you are very, very close to the thumb. Okay? This is one of the strategies that we use to save a lot of resources. We don't process most of the information that is out there. We just concentrate on very tiny patches of the visual image, and that's what we process. This is another strategy. Look at the blobs, color blobs that you have there. Okay, can you see them? Of course you could. Now look, stare directly at the black dot and try not to move your eyes. And what happened to the other dots, to the blobs, the color blobs? <laughs> they go away. They start to go away, the, the, the weaker ones, the, the, the blue ones, then the yellow, and finally the purple. There's another thing that happens here. Well, this is adaptation. This is a strategy that the brain uses constantly to save energy. The brain cares only about things that change. If I have a, 
uh, a pattern of stimulation that is constantly uh, uh, being received, then the brain doesn't need to know about it. Okay, how many of you notice your shoes? Until I said it, none. When I said it, you all wiggled your, your toes and, and, and there. There you had the shoes. Okay, so this is adaptation. We actually uh, don't care about things that we can take for granted, that we know the other, okay? That saves also a lot of resources. And then there's another strategy. We don't analyze anything in absolute terms. We analyze everything relative to, uh, to, to other frames of references that, that we have, even both in space and or time. If I ask you, of these gray disks, which one is lighter and which one is darker, what would you say? Which one is lighter, left or right? Left. left. But you know they are the same. They are exactly the same, the, meaning that they reflect the same amount of light, the one on the right, on the left and the one on the right. We perceive them differently because they are surrounded by patches of gray of different shades. Right? And this is extremely important because, for instance, here, this is an illusion created by another TED, by Ted Adelson at MIT. We have a checkerboard like this, and the square A is one of the black ones, and the square B is one of the white ones, right, in the checkerboard. But if I remove all the information that is around them, you'll see that they are exactly the same. There's no difference between them. Yeah? So we can actually perceive them as if they were different. Okay. This has consequences. This way of analyzing images has consequences for everything. Just stir here at the, at the center of this line. Try not to move the eyes and see what happened to the faces. Can you see the faces? Are they normal? <laughs> now, move your eyes around and see that the pictures are really normal. Go back to the line in the middle. <laughs> Crazy, huh? The thing is that we're using information about the previous phase to process the, second, the, the, the next one coming in sequence. So, if somebody has a very particularly salient feature, it's going to be highlighted even more by this process. So it's like a caricature, okay? And, and this is interesting because caricature is something that we, that we do and that I'll see at the end. Now, the third problem. The third problem is that the brain is also extremely slow. It's slow, it's much slower than any cell phone that any of you can have now in the pockets. And, and by slow, I mean that the computational elements of the brain are slow, okay? Um, and just to give you a brief example, this is an image of the visual system. This is the eye, the brain. Information processing in the visual system takes a long time. To begin with, it gets delayed already in the retina, 20 milliseconds, right? That's how long it takes on average to process visual information in the retina. This information is, this, is then transferred to the brain and it reaches primary visual cortex, which is the first place of the cortex that's gonna deal with visual information. But it takes between 40 and 80 milliseconds. We're starting to build up in delays right now. Then this information is transferred to the inferotemporal cortex where cells are selective to specific objects of the environment. So these are the cells that tell the brain exactly what are the object, objects in the visual scene. And it takes also time, 200 milliseconds takes processing in this, in, in, in this area. And that information about the objects in, 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 in the visual scene that is necessary to influence our behavior, it's delayed between 200 and 800 milliseconds to reach actually the primary visual cortex, which means that if I see a friend in the street, it takes me almost a second to wave just uh, greeting him. Okay, with these delays, it's almost impossible that we can cross the street, right? So we cannot wait to see things to act upon them, right? It's not possible. Think about tennis. Did you play tennis, any of you? A tennis court is like 
a little shy of 24 meters long, okay? And any of the professional players uh, can throw the ball at over 200 kilometers per hour, which means that you have less than 300 milliseconds to see the ball, direct your body towards where it's going to hit, and then respond appropriately to send it back to, the, to the, your opponent's field or to your opponent's part of the court. It's not possible, okay? We cannot do it that way, simply. And the brain doesn't do it that way. Okay, what does the brain do then? All these strategies that the brain uses to save energy and to save time are based on perceiving very little information and then act upon that by, I was going to say creating, but the message that I want to tra transmit is that the brain does not create reality. But I'm going to tell it at the end, the, the message. So what do you see here? I have just a bunch of luminous borders in a random position. What do you see here? Most of you would say nothing. Some of you would venture, okay, maybe a cactus. My son says a sword. Everything is a sword for him. He's just six <laughs> years old. So, but very little information still. If I now start to play with it, it's exactly the same information. <laughs> exactly the same. Now you get a better picture, right? But it's, not, it's a picture that is not there. It's a picture that is in your heads. So don't blame me. <laughs> right? OK. Are extremely important. And this illustrates another thing, superadditivity, which means that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. A lot more. OK. We are in Barcelona. And do you know this guy, uh, Ronaldinho, soccer player. He used to play for Barcelona a few uh, a few years back. This is a picture, a real picture, and this is a caricature. Which one of the two conveys the idea of Ronaldinho best? Which one? I'm this serious. Right? The caricature conveys the idea best. And this is something that Ramachandran, which I think comes next, uh, called peak shift. In perception, we take very little information, and that information is used to create the image. So the most salient or the more specific the information that we take is, then the better. OK. So here you, oops, I'm sorry. What you have here is he put the example, Ramachandran put the, exam, the example of the Chola dynasty in India, these sculptures, in which it's roughly, uh, or, or they, they highlight exactly what's unique in the body of the, of, of the, in the female body, and what, what's different, completely different and incompatible with, with the male body, for instance. So you have large breasts, and broad hips, and this posture, which is the Tribanga posture, which is almost impossible for a man, so I'm not gonna try to do it now. And, uh, <laughs> which is something that the models know that is extremely effective and they, and, and they use. So we went to the lab, we did experiments, we took, it's, it's, it's mostly like you take the body of the female, the body of the male, you subtract them and what's left is, is the idea of the female body, right? So we did exactly that. We took a regular female, a regular male, we subtract them and fair enough, the, the tribanga <laughs> thing there emerged. Now, he, Ramachandran postulates that this is the basis of art, right? The maximizing the workings of the visual system, making uh, the work easy for the visual system are the roots of, of art. Now, I want you to look at this, and this is probably my second to last or something like that, or last uh, slide. I want you to look at this. What do you see? Come on, it's easy, fried egg with french fries or whatever. Just that, you just see that. Can you see the hen incubating the egg on the nest? Yeah? This would be the nest, and this would be the hen incubating the egg. Okay, this is by Dean Matamoro, by the way, the same artist that produced the first slides. What I think this means is that actually art is exactly the opposite to what Ramachandran was postulating with the big shift effect. 
is making us harder and harder the work of uh, resolving a, a visual image, resolving the problem of vision. Because when you do that, and there's this ambiguity, there's this problem, you get activation in the orbital frontal cortex, which is part of the reward system, right? And it's very involved with that. So when you see the hand here, actually what happens is a relief, like, oh, I got it. That's right, right? Exactly that. Okay, and this has to do with camouflage. That's the evolutionary <coughs> meaning of it. Can you see the lion there? It's extremely important because whether it is, whether it is a zebra or a lion, it makes a whole lot of a difference. So seeing is not image transmission, it's problem solving, okay? And I'm gonna leave you with the egg chicken problem of perception, which is that reality is not something that the visual system creates. Reality is already in your head. All perception does is to play the movie and put you in a particular space and time within that movie. But you cannot see anything that is not already in your head. If it is not in your head, you won't see it. Okay? Thank you.